Hello, listeners. This is Jim the Keys bartender coming to you from Key Largo in the beautiful Florida Keys. Beautiful day today. I think it's about 78 degrees and sunny. I didn't spend much time outside yet, but I plan to. I plan to. I got to run some errands. Got to do some things before I go into work. And I'll talk about work a little. I just wanted to talk about the first I made a drink last night. I haven't made, I don't make too often, but it was one of the, I I remember it from the, when I was in college, it's called the B-52, Kahlua, Bailey's, and Grand Marnier. And it's a shot that uh, you do about a half ounce of each. And it's one of, from the family of the layered shots. And it's very important to do it in the order of this. Kahlua, Bailey's, and Grand Marnier. So when you pour it in a shot glass, you're doing about a half a shot each, half ounce, and a half ounce each. So that'll work out to be an ounce and a half, but or you a little less than that. But you put the Kahlua in first, and then you take either the convex side of a spoon, you dip the front into the liquor below, and you pour it across the top of that spoon so it doesn't go, you know, it doesn't pour into the Kahlua. So you're going to put the uh, Baileys in, you're going to pour that, hopefully through a pour. You can do it free pour, but it's a little harder. I did it last night. You just got to be real steady with your hands. And then the last one, the grandma, yeah, you got to be really careful with that because that kind of gets muddy a little. But you can still see the layers. You'll see a Kahlua, a clear Kahlua layer, Bailey's layer, and grandma, yeah. I don't know how important it is because I we keep our Bailey's chilled. But most of the times that B-52 is made room temperature because the temperature of liquids could change the specific gravity of it. You've seen it with water and see how it pulls around and sugar and stuff like that. It rises and falls and things like that. So I have a feeling that if you can keep them all room temperatures good or all chilled. When I say chilled, I'm not saying use ice because I don't know how that would affect it because when you sh- when it's shaking over ice, you never know how much content of uh, water you get into it. And then you have water mixing in with the stuff, and that stuff could just get all cloudy. So if your effect is to do a layered shot, because people like that. They like the looks at it. It just enhances their quality. I know. Here I am, the sober guy telling you how important it is to keep it separated. But you know what? Presentation is important. That's why we garnish our drinks sometimes. People don't always use that garnish. They just like to see it. You know, sometimes you need to have... Sometimes a motherfucker has to have a drink in a coconut. You know, sometimes they need a layered shot. So luckily that person ordered last night. We had a busy night last night. I wanted to talk about that. We had a new musician come in named Adam. And I met him a couple days before the owner introduced me since I've handled most of the social media for the restaurant. And he seemed like a really nice guy. And, but I... You know, I always wait. And people say, oh, I got, you want to check it out before I play? And I'm saying, are you playing Friday night? And he says, yes. I guess I'll check you out on Friday night when I'm working. There's no reason for that. But he seemed like a really great guy. And it was a really pleasant surprise that I was able to say truthfully that he was a great musician. He is a great musician. I hope he plays there often. He just came down from Virginia. And he plays like, I guess late 60s, 70s, 80s, some 90s. And it's not Jimmy Buffett or the traditional island fair. And I say, you know what? There's hundreds of musicians that do that. And I know some of the tourist places, they really like to have that for the people. But when you're spending time down here and you're entertaining locals, it's good to have a nice repertoire of things other than Jimmy Buffett. You know, non-Jimmy Buffett, non-reggae music. I like, I had enjoyed all that of reggae and Jimmy Buffett, but uh, pretty much Buffett got overplayed down here. And you've heard me say that before. No offense to Jimmy Buffett, because you go to any other place in the United States, as long as it's not Margaritaville, you'll hear Jimmy Buffett in a rotation. 
not as the sole basis for all the music. So Adam came in and played a bunch of music, and when he came up, the you know had to get used to the the volume in the when you're playing in a smaller place like we are. And he's a lone musician, and he had I saw some drums, I saw a guitar, I saw some amplifiers, and they were older amplifiers. So I just said, "Oh man, this guy's like a you know." He, he, he's old school, but he wasn't an old guy. He looked like he was in his late 30s, early 40s, and he did a great job, and it was so easy to talk to him. When some, when someone comes in, you just, I had this thing, and I, I know it comes from the basis of my, of a strong people pleasing quality in me, and I just, I'm not one of those guys to go on there and leave a negative review Unless the people are militantly trying to give horrible customer service or product or something like that. And I rarely, if you do a search on that, I rarely have given out those. And I reserve those either. I And I know that abuses the rating system. But unless, if they're really horrible and I think they could be negligent or just a horrible person or something like that. I can foresee I do it. I would do it if if I felt. But I try not to fuck around with people's livelihoods. So when someone delivers good service, I like to give good reviews. When they do okay, especially with musicians, they come in here and I guess it's kind of reflective of me being a podcaster because there's so many people out there to do podcasts that have great music, great sound editing, great voices. I'm not, I don't want to say content because I think I do pretty good with content. Pretty good with content. But I don't know. I, I explained my strategy to you. I have, since we're talking about the internet, it's solely, doing a podcast is solely different than musicians. Musicians when, unless you're doing just YouTube the, and then you reach the audience you want. But musicians, when they're in a place, they're appealing to the people there. And they have to have a general appeal, right? A podcast doesn't have to have a general appeal. It has to have a particular appeal and it has to find its audience. And some musicians, if you're unique, if they want to be popularly, you know, just so sell music and so I, I keep on saying sell records who has records anymore but sell music and be popular and all those things they have to find their audience too but when you're covering covering music you have to be generally pleasing to your audience and this guy was good he got people up to dance he's pleasant he's nice he's uh, almost too nice I know it sounds like I have a, a I think he's got guy's name's Adam. He's originally from Virginia and he came in from Georgia, but it's a good guy. And it was a pleasure for once to be able to just say to someone, not that I haven't done it. We have some wonderful people on Saturday night. We have Rich and Kelly. Kelly Rich is a great guitar player and has nice vocals. And Kelly's a vocalist and she has beautiful vocals. So they together, they're excellent. So, but they're, um, Rich was playing there and then Kelly came in. It wasn't, I knew he, he was, a, he's a music teacher, so I know his quality's high. His, his standards are high. So when I get, sometimes I get people in there really nice and they're musicians and you know they're trying, right? But the trouble is that they're coming in and have to be generally pleasing to everyone. And unless they bring in their own audience, which, you know, that, that sucks when you're bringing your own audience because you're bringing people in that have to have to come in for a couple drinks and that's it. But if you can be general pleasing to the people that are there, that are eating and drinking already, that is the most positive outcome you can have. And then bring other people in. So this guy had a, I mean, we had a good crowd last night. Part of it was, and it was, I didn't expect a good crowd because it was his first time. It takes a couple takes a couple of time, you know, time for people to, but we had regulars come in. We had regulars that heard it and they're going to spread the word and they're going to say this guy was really good on a Friday night. And I have imagined that those people will come in 
and the people, you know, the people that came, those people that heard him will come in, and then they'll tell other people, and they'll come in and say, oh, they, they, you know, the catch has a good musician on Friday night. And I hope he stays there because, uh, and I explained to him, it's it's funny, you know, musicians tip me at the end of the night. I give them drinks and stuff like that. I support them and stuff like that. And I said, listen, you doing a good job already, already is compensation for me. I know, I'm turning down money. Why do you say, listen, you're working. I, I appreciate your tips and stuff like that, but I don't I don't expect it. I appreciate it, but I don't expect it. It's a different. When you appreciate something and not expect it. So when I do run into people, though, that come in, musicians, and are really nice, and I want to be friendly with them and stuff like that, but you hear them playing music and you say, oh, you know, playing's all right. The voice is flat. The, the the music selection is not my cup of tea. And and the people that come in are, I hate to say it, some of them are just cheap. And they, for some reason, people think it's having the seat filled and them drinking water is good enough to say, look at all the people I brought in. I said, that is not, we are not a venue for people to come in and just listen to you. We are a venue for people to buy you know, to make, you know, to do things, to drink and eat food. And because we're a profit, a for-profit, we're not a community park. But I, I don't say that to him. What do I say to him? I'll say things like, oh, you have really nice equipment or nice song selection. Or in one case, I say, you know, you rarely see the kazoo brought out in music anymore. What do you think? You know, what do you think? And then... I'll say, oh, yeah, it was great. And I'm lying through my teeth. It was great. And I'm just, I hate doing that. But I don't want to be the harbinger. If you're, you know, in your late 40s or in your 30s and you don't realize that you're uh, a, my, you know, an okay musician or bad musician, then I, I don't need to be the one. I don't want to be the one to burst your bubble. I don't. I don't need to be that one. You got to go and find uh, someone who's going to be straight shooter. And say, you know, you got to think about doing something different. I had people come and tell me that for bartending. You said maybe you shouldn't be working with people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've had bad days, and that's what I wanted to talk about. The next thing, and I'll be the lion's share of it. Uh, last night, I mean, during every through, you, you've heard the term before to in every life some rain must fall and that's assuming that rain's a bad you know rain is not always a bad thing right obviously farmers need rain it rains good for your water supply it's great for the surrounding so you, rain can't be automatically seen as that you know when it's raining a lot all the time when you have too much rain yeah that could be kind of negative I understand that symbolism but rain is not always a bad thing just like adversity that rain that's the metaphor for it that rain is adversity is negativity is things that happen in your life and we all go through those things where not everything's going right and there's some downright bad things going and for that it's really hard to address and I'm not suggesting that the podcast is good enough for that so if you're going through a lot of adversity and you're having some really really horrible time of it um, I hope this podcast helps you but you really got to get help if it's changing your point of view if you're feeling bad about yourself you think about hurting yourself you think that life isn't worth the effort then yeah, you got to seek help. You got to go get that, nip that in the bud before anything. Just do it. Change, change that thought. Do whatever. And I realize some people going through. Some people are very ill. They got family members, loved ones, pets. Oh, we have a dog that's. Um, or, and, and she, the dog is a uh, Roxy's a family member and she's getting old and decrepit and you know with a dog that's an accelerated thing right I mean she woke up she's feeble now 
in a matter of six months. And there's other things. We've had health issues in, in, here in our family. We're t- and whenever you have a health issue, sometimes you kind of blow it into something more than it is. Sometimes it is more, it is that ex- extreme thing. We have to deal with those. And then you've got to really go on a full tilt push. But sometimes the adversity is piled on. You know, loss of job, loss of your place, your, your home, your finances, your relationship with a uh, uh, wife or husband or wife or, or children or friends, your relationships can problem. You can have a problem with substance abuse or general, a general hard time, adversity occurs. And that adversity, that rain that falls into our lives doesn't have to be 100% negative, does it? And let me explain why. I always felt that you, it's, you really appreciate that sun coming out when you've had a couple days of rain. Or like, it could be a blizzard, it could be ice storms, it could be anything. A hurricane. The eye of, when, a, when a hurricane's going on, the eye goes over, it's temporary, I understand that, and then you have more of the hurricane going. But after it passes and you're, you survived, you survived it. You survived that adversity at the end. Now, you're saying, I may not have needed that. Well, if you're able to survive that and you have the right attitude, you have an added empathy for other, you should have an added empathy for other people that are going through the same things. And realize that some people are going through worse. Right after, well, I don't know how close, but it seemed like abbreviated, look back from about four or five years ago, four, a little over four years ago, Irma. We had a lot of damage in the Keys. But then another one came about, and I don't know if it was that year or a year after, but it was Michael. And it hit uh, the panhandle of Florida. And it totally abolished the city of Mexico, Mexico Beach, Mexican Beach in the panhandle. You just, the, the visuals were horrendous. And you just think these people's properties were destroyed. That is severe adversity. People losing their houses to tornadoes and things like that and the jobs and stuff. And I know that's a lot of negativity and stuff like that. But that, that part, that resilience where we come back, that's the sweet, the sweet spot when you appreciate it. When you appreciate before it happens sometimes. The good life. Having bank up those good experiences fortify us for those negativity to rise. Say it's not all bad. It's not all bad. And when you're in it but when you're in the depth of this adversity, when things are happening, IRS is asking you you're having problems with those, you're having some legal issues, work issues, relationship problems. When you're in that well, like in a deep in a well, and you just see you can see the light at the top. You say, how in the hell am I going to reach that light? How am I going to get there? But you, you, for sometimes adversity seems to pass. Those issues seem to pass. That, that lump on your arm is not cancer. It's a cyst and the doctor drained it and it's fine. The relationship issue you're having with your loved one, you know, is is because they were having trouble at work and stuff like that, and you're you you weren't able to communicate. You got over that rough spot. Sometimes you don't get or Sometimes you have to get separated and divorced, right? But then you haven't. You could have another relationship. Some people have severe problems. Severe problems, and they don't walk away from them easily. But they survive, and some of them even thrive. It's amazing. So it's it's easy when you're in it to feel like a loser, like life's unfair, like you have a dark cloud following you. And, And sometimes those experiences actually fuel the other experience you have sometimes people without 
there's apparently you're looking at you may look at people you see in your community or your your you know in the media you say those people never experience adversity well yeah they do and if they don't experience a lot of it if you're sheltered you know sheltering someone from certain negativity or adversity is 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 a kind meaning to it has a kind meaning to it i don't want my children to have to go through this i don't want to have anybody i don't but you're not going to be there all the time you know there's there's people down here that were brought up in wealth and they got separated from that now they're they're living in adversity they didn't have it before you know these trust funds and stuff like that it's just like in relationships if you, there's these beautiful people out there lovely you just think of the, 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 the kids you go to school with these beautiful girls handsome guys and stuff like that they never have a problem finding a relationship they find it in high school they find it in college they find it in, well, at their place of work there, 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 there and, but they didn't have the heartache of being sh- you know jilted or dumped or rejected by um, potential paramours. Well, eventually they might have that. And they don't have the experience or the wherewithal to be able to say, well, I've experienced this before and I've done this. I've done this before. I've, th- that is one of my special fortes when I was the last 20 years. Whenever I had a relationship, you know, I, before I got a couple years before I got married the first time. Uh, when a relationship break up, I had so many relations before. I go, well, I can't, I'm going to feel bad about this for a week or two, but it's going to, I, it's just the nature of things. I'm going to, I'm going to come out of it and I'm going to have another relationship. So that's always there. And you always think, well, I'm never, I'm never going to find anybody. Well, that's that. I didn't have that because I knew, and it's not because I was one of the best looking guys, or something like that. I just was. I knew. I know the nature of relationships. You're going to find it if you, if you, you fish in a lot of places. And I don't call, I'm not comparing relationships to fishing, but if you you ch- you change your prospects when you have a wider circle a wider circle of places that you travel in and people that know you and then you end up and try to you know try to have some redeeming qualities about you so what i what made me think about these things was there was two movies two movies and and there's other movies out there but the, I, I find them for me when it comes to adversity for different reasons. One is Cinderella Man. It's a, and I spoke about this previously before, but it's about this boxing, heavyweight boxer from the late 20s into the 30s. Okay, James J. Braddock. And he became, when he was young, he became a heavyweight champion. And he amassed a decent amount of money, but then... The stock market crash happened in 1929. He had lost most of his money. And at the same time, he was injured. And he, in order to recover, I, I think this is, they didn't do a lot in this story, in this movie, but they, he was doing a lot of fights in order to recoup some of his losses. And he got injured and he didn't have enough time to really recover. And he, he was losing fights and on technicalities. It was really never, he was never knocked out. I think, until Joe Lewis, maybe. But I don't think he was ever knocked. Technically lost by a knockout. Until till the end. And eventually the Boxing Commission of New York and New Jersey took away his license to fight. And he, his, he lost all his money. He ended up living in North Jersey in a tenement with his wife and three kids. And he had to go on relief and it was a relief back then in the early 1930s. It was called relief. And it was very little money. It was like, 
I think it turned out to be like $14, $24 a month, $24 a month. And they were barely getting by. He was trying to be a longshoreman. And they there wasn't a lot because it was in the midst of the uh, depression. There just were so many people out of work. So they would just, you know, guys would go up on the docks and they would pay, take whoever came in, like take up to eight, ten guys they had, and they would just, you know, call them in, and it would be like 40, 50 people, and they wouldn't get jobs that day. And you get a little, you know, little extra money he made as a longshoreman went in, and with the, the relief he was getting. So eventually, he healed, and his manager got him a fight. Uh, an ex- it was almost like an exhibition fight because there was this this guy who was a uh, a rising contender, and the person that was supposed to fight him couldn't fight. So there was James J. Braddock, and they said, "Listen, let's bring him out here." And he is a sentimental. Uh, people remember him, and they they just. He was a guy that was never knocked out, and he was going to fight. If this guy knocks, and the guy, the rising contender, the young guy, would knock him out, then it would be like a good show. And James Braddock would get some money, you know, to keep him out of the poorhouse a little long. But he ends up winning the fight. But you can see all the adversity he was going through. I mean, he was at the top of his game. He was wealthy. He had a beautiful house in New Jersey and stuff like that. And then he ended up living in a tenement. He's trying to work get jobs as a, as a longshoreman and and on uh, relief, which was back then it was felt shameful to, be, to have to be on relief, but the guys felt as if they were failing their families so he ended up coming all the way back and he uh, ended up fighting the champ at the time and he wins and he ends up paying back all his the relief money, not that it was required of paying it back, but he came back and he paid all his relief back because he felt that he lives in a country that was great enough to take care of you when you were down. And he wanted to be able to be returned a f- uh, favor. And he ended up winning. And But you can see how his wife stood behind him. The wife, the wife uh, didn't want him to fight anymore. She would rather, you know, stay where they were, you're living than... Have him get beat up again, and but he ended up winning, becoming the championship, uh, the champ, heavyweight champion again, and he eventually lost to Joe Lewis. But by then he had, you know, had um, the you know economy was coming back and all that stuff. He bought equipment. He ended up be owning a construction company, helped build the Veranzano Bridge, and he looked like, I mean. He he made it through, and I love watching that. You see him come back, and his wife telling him, "Don't do this fight," even though he was going to make a lot of money from it and stuff like that. And he did it. And I always get kind of, and it, from what I understand, it was very faithfully recreated. It's around a Ron Howard uh, film. Uh, Russell Crowe plays Jim Braddock. Renee Zellweger's the wife, and uh, the the manager, the fight manager of Braddock's, played by Paul Giamatti. It was a beautiful period film. So I watched that. I, guess I love seeing people defeat, you know, uh, beat out adversity. And then the other one was kind of kind of similar, but not exactly, Jerry Maguire. And everyone, if you know Jerry Maguire, it's Tom Cruise maybe, and Re- Renee Zellweger again. Wow. And... When he loses, when he goes and writes that, and so here's a guy on top of his game. He's a he's a sports agent, and he writes a mission statement that everyone calls a memo, but he wrote a mission statement. It's kind of like a report, twelve page report on how they should have take less money, spend more time, care more about the clients and stuff like that, and ended up getting him fired. And he loses all his clients. And he has but one client left, and that's Cuba Gooding Jr., who, you know, in the end, if most of the people saw that, 
he his his relationship with his new newlywed wife falls apart, but it comes, you know, after Cuba and Junior and all that stuff, it ends it ends well. But there's a lot of adversity this guy's going through. Mainly for him, it's professional and relationship, not health. And he doesn't have any kids. I mean, he does now. He has a stepson and a and a wife. But he he could he would have just lost his job by himself and had to go done something else. But I like watching these movies because it's in the end you see how horrible for these relatively people get through life. And there, you can see more extreme examples. Hotel Rwanda about the hotel manager who rescues, I think I'll say a thousand people during the Hutu, uh, Tutsi civil wars in Rwanda after the Rwandan president died. There was, there was, they killed almost a million people in three months. A million Tutsis were killed in Rwanda. They were blamed. They were, they were settling tribal scores and stuff like that. And it turned, but this guy, Paul, who was the manager, who's played by, oh God, I can't remember the guy's name. But he's a great actor. It was a great, really superior movie. Out of all those movies, I have to say Hotel Rwanda was probably the best movie, critically the best movie. Um, Jerry Maguire was the best entertaining and Hotel Rwanda was probably more historically correct. The less were about the personal conversations. The historically true ones were Cinderella Man and Hotel Rwanda. But all these people at the end, and the more severe one, Hotel Rwanda, where genocide's going on, and he is able to bring his family and the children of his brother-in-law, being able to have them survive and, and all the people that he brought into the hotel to protect. But at those things, it kind of reminder, I don't always like watching those movies. I have a hard time watching those movies when I'm going through things that aren't that great. And it's easy for me to even have that. And I've done that over the last couple, last year. It's good, bad. It's not always string of victories going on. It's not always a stroll through a rose garden. But those things, I think, make me more appreciative of the, really, the, the being able to appreciate the good things that are going on are enhanced by my experience, my other experiences are not so fun. So I can embrace some of the adversity when it happens. You, life is so precarious in the situations you cannot protect yourself from the things that happen all the time unforeseen or seen sometimes we, we let things go on and we might be somewhat responsible for the troubles that come into our life with the people we associate with but other times the fate fate determines what your life will be like but only you have the you know, real ultimate say on how you're going to react to it. That's that's what I'm here for right now. And and like I said, if you are going through really, really tough times, I imagine you're not listening to podcasts. And this is just to fortify you when you do. Because there, there are, it's hard to really see that from the depths of that that place you are. The place you are. It's really hard when you're angry at someone. It's hard to realize that saying, oh, wait a second, I love this person. You don't remember. You don't remember. You can just think you're, the, the, the anger is so topical. The disappointment is so there in front of you. And, uh, just being able to move beyond it or just being able to appreciate there is a flip side to it, that works for me sometimes. It's, it's brought me through it. And uh, 
I know everyone knows how to cope. I'm, you know, Jim, I'm a grown-up. I've done, I've fucking done this before. Well, that's not for you then. Then that show isn't for you. But you maybe if you, when, when we are, we've gone through it, we fortified people that have been through adversity. Some of the best people I know have used that experience to help other people that are going through it. People who have thought of suicide working on a suicide hotline. I don't know if that's necessarily true. If you're chronic, you have chronic de- depression, maybe you shouldn't be working for that. Um, consult, you know, a healthcare expert, a mental health expert. But I know with through my twelve step programs, my experience with AA, that the people that have experienced the trials and tribulation of being an alcoholic are the best, are real well suited to relate to people that are going through recovery. And if you're fortunate enough to have enough experience and you're able, fortunate to remember that, um, at least for me, when it comes to sobriety, the way I view it is that I've experienced seven years of recovery, seven, 2007 to 2014, then five years of drinking, and that five years of drinking afterwards reinforced that I wasn't cut out to be one of those people that are moderate drinkers. It's never going to happen. So that has reinforced this last, it'll be going on two years next month. I'm not asking for a pat on the back because the only pat on the back I really deserve is for myself. So yeah, I did that for many years. That's a, That was my adversity. I was doing it to myself. So once you realize that, that life won't get any better, there won't be anything good coming out of that for me, at least I'm specifically talking about alcohol, all I have to do is choose not to do alcohol right now. There's no there's no situation where that the alcoholism used to trick me and say, well, listen, I'm missing out on fun, I'm missing out on a good time, I'm not getting relaxed, I get, at the end of the day I can like to have a drink, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I don't do that. I don't do that anymore. I don't think about it. That's why at the beginning of your show, I could talk about making, constructing a B-52 shot. And there's people out there right now, I know they're in the depths of it. Sometimes I share with them. I'm hoping that, um, I tend to see, to share that because when people try, if you're not in the bar business, it's, a lot of people say, can I buy your shot? Will you drink with us? And, I explain to them, so because I want them to come back if they're nice and they're kind and stuff like that, I go, I'm sorry. I, I, I tell them right out. I said, I can't drink. I said, I don't drink. And people have known me for years. They say, Jim, do you ever drink like a little? Do you drink any wine or anything like that? And I said, no, I don't do a little bit. And I, I, I there was someone I know from the neighborhood, I'm not going to even say this, the sex of the person. Every time I've seen them, I have seen them. They they would progressively have more signs of the heavy drinking. I'd see it come out. And don't you know, this person came in, and they're not drinking anymore. And they look. I said, I noticed a difference in them. They came in. They were a different gait. They were. They asked for a zero zero beer, which. I only had my I, I only consider having zero zero beer after like a year and a half. And I don't keep any extra in my fridge. A zero zero beer is zero but I just thought that person I said, Good. I said I do have and I go like this just as I said I do have claws taller, but it does have point two five percent alcohol in it. So I see this person. They looked happy too. They looked different. They look different. But you know what? Like I said, you know, people would, there's people that are my age going for their first bouts of sobriety and they can look back on a whole lifetime of drinking, you know, from the time they were in their teens until they're 60 years old. And they say, why did I waste all that time? Well, maybe it wasn't wasting. Maybe that's the adversity that you needed in order to fortify you, in order to be sober and appreciate that part. Right? Or people that decide to get fit 
and saying, well, I want my blood pressure to go down. I'm going to start eating right now. I'm going to start exercising. Blah, 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 blah. Well, the adversity of being on the couch and being accused of the, and, and it's I know there's horrible things where people are going through end-stage issues. I don't know how to address that that much. I won't, I won't do that because they're going through a specific journey on that, and that's a personal decision. But you did have good times. You do, you know, whenever you're going through adversity, you got to remember that the, you had good times. That you had good times, you could have them again. I know it's kind of negative, but hey, I'm going to be positive. I'm not going to, I'm not going to change segue and get anything silly right now. I want to thank you for listening today. Uh, it's a beautiful day, so it was easy. It would have been easy just to talk about how beautiful it was here and how it's like 78 degrees, how the guanas are running around happy and all that stuff and tons of birds out there, right? But I thought it was important to, to say, right? And every so often, and if you do know someone that's not feeling so well, drop them a line, say hello, uh, tell them how you feel about and as long as it's supporting them. And uh, if you don't have anybody, if you're going through it yourself, reach out to someone. Uh, if you are a listener, I'd like to thank for all the people that are downloading episodes. We're doing um, not so busy this week. Not so busy. But you know what? I guess I can't hit a home run every week. Can't hit a home run every week. But I do appreciate for everyone that's downloaded. Download as many episodes as you can. The important, once again, if you can hold on and listen to my line of thinking... The more downloads we have, the higher the rankings we have. We have great rankings right now. When we get a little higher, we have more reviews. We're we're on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, um, Spreaker, of course. That's my base thing. But uh, iHeartRadio, I do appreciate you guys for listening. If you could share this with your friends, uh, thanks a lot. And also all my foreign listeners. I mean, I had a listener from Bosnia. Bosnia, Herzegovina. I, go, hmm. I do appreciate that. You know, thanks. Taiwan, India, Germany, Great Britain. Great Britain's coming through. No, Ireland. I don't ever, I, I don't know. I may have had a couple of listeners in Ireland and not so much in Scotland. It's funny. I may, I'm like, maybe. 75% Irish of Irish descent and I guess my humor doesn't really uh, appeal to that maybe definitely not the Scottish or the British the Canadian can, Canadians it does not so much Australia yeah yeah I think I had Adelaide, listeners in Adelaide and things like that so out of all the English speaking countries uh, U.S. is still U.S. and Canada is still the main stay on that, and I do appreciate those other countries you know, that don't. You know, English is not their native tongue. Uh, thank you, and keep those downloads going. This is Jim the Keys bartender. I'll talk to you next week.